timing of that right there was perfect. <laughs> Wasn't it perfect? It's like dangerous snow comes in. Blah, 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 blah. And all of a sudden I'm right here. I'm drinking out of a straw. I got some Kool-Aid because it's kind of late, not going to lie. It's like, I don't know, 11.15 here on Wednesday, July 20th edition of Heliocrat Diaries. Ow! Come on, boy. Come on, girl. We're going to rock out. And what are we going to do? We're going to do what we always do. We're going to be entering the octagon. We're going to do that in a moment. Right? We're going to be talking about apologetics, continuing our awesome discussion of Colin Causey's amazing essay. It's like 32 pages long of absolute awesomeness. And it's entitled Presuppositional Apologetics, Reformed vs. Catholic Perspectives. Long overdue. It's long overdue. You know, I'm super pumped though. I'm not going to lie. Super dupe psyched. I'm not psyched about the color of this shirt and this hue. <laughs> it doesn't go. I'm wearing a purple shirt. What in the world? <laughs> We're going to have to change that. People are like, this guy's colorblind. You know what? doesn't matter. doesn't matter. Number one, I'm wearing sunglasses at night. Number two, it doesn't really matter anyway in the grand scheme of things. Because our ultimate purpose and ultimate aim, in fact, is to restore all things in Christ the King. And we do that every single day and night by taking a knee for him. It's what we do because he has all power and all authority right now. We don't play around. That influences the way that we look at the world. It influences the way that we look at ourselves, that we determine deep inside to never give up, to keep on smiling. And remember, one day we're gonna die. So what do we do? Well, we got a king of king and lord of lords reigning right now, placing everything under his feet. So we gotta dream bigger thoughts. We gotta let him take control, give everything we've got completely into his hands and say, transform us, do an awesome job through us, enlighten us as to what we need to do when we encounter other people, that we can lead them to a deeper richness in Christ the Lord. That's what we do. That is what we do. I got, man, I gotta look at this. I'm wearing, I'm wearing a black tie with a blue shirt. That's totally fake. <laughs> That's totally fake. Watch this. I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you some magic. Watch this. It's going to be pretty cool. I, I don't think I've ever done this to show, like, exactly kind of, like, what I do. It's super secret, to be honest. This is, like, this is, like, the secret stuff here. Let's see here. Hue shift. Let's get it back to where it really is. Oh, yeah. It's not that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Not that. Not that. There we go. And that. Well, and it was better before. Now I'm looking all, like... I'm looking all creepy. <laughs> I'm looking all creepy. What the heck, man? What's going on with this? No, no. Well, forget it. Forget it. We're just going to roll with it. It's actually, it, it, thing is, it actually goes really well. <laughs> Believe it or not. Actually, watch this. I'm going to show you one more trick. Check this out. I'm going to see if this actually works better. We're going to go here. Watch. We're going to see if this actually works, okay? We are going to go. What, what should I pick here? Should I pick drive? Should I pick teal and orange? Or should I pick, uh, what's the one I've been using? I've been using a really, really good one. And it's been really awesome. I've, I've, I've loved it recently. Been using it a whole bunch. Is it punch? I don't know. We're just gonna, we're, we're just gonna go with this. Well, let's see what we're gonna do here. Let's see. We're gonna do rhythm. No, we're not. <laughs> do you see what's happening? I, I just ruined everything. <laughs> Everybody's like, dude, just don't do it. I think it's this one. <laughs> no, it's not. Forget it. We're going back to the gross purple. I hope you're having fun, by the way. People are like, this guy's very unprofessional. No, actually, I'm telling you right now, this is super dupe professional <laughs> right now. And and to let you know, 100% for sure, would a non-professional wear glasses like these? That's just a fact. So here's the thing. I want to apologize first. I, I intended to do this evening's show on the meaning of Catholic, and it's just not happening. It's not happening. I guess, you know, every once in a while, because I, I don't own the channel... I'm, I give access to the channel. Sometimes it makes you re-log in. The only problem with that is that I would have to have Tim Flanders verify the password and all that. He's got to do it on his device. And the guy's like a grandpa. He goes to sleep at like five in the afternoon. <laughs> five, five in the evening. You know, he eats one of those late lunches and calls it a dinner and then just goes to bed. So that's, that's what you do. So anyway, we're going to go real quick to the sponsor. As soon as we're done with that, we're going right into the topic. As, as you could find out from the title, and I have the essay linked in the description below. Uh, you can check out that entire essay. But today we're going to be talking about culpability and the idea of an unbeliever suppressing what they know, self-deception. 
And I, I want to do an entire series on that. There's an excellent, I have a couple books that are really good on the idea of self-deception and, and why would you be guilty of that? And how is it possible? Well, it's a controversial thing to even say self-deception. Uh, I mean, how do you deceive yourself? It's like playing chess against yourself or trying to scare yourself with a really spooky spider that you put somewhere. <laughs> and you go, ah! I mean, you're not scared. You're not scared at all. So how does that work? We're going to talk a little bit about that today. And, uh, and so make sure if, you, if you've already seen this promo, if you've already seen the ad and you don't have your, your juice or your coffee or your booze, make sure to go grab that right now. If you have not, however seen the promo of The Saint Maker, please stick around. It is worth the while. I can tell you that right now. It's an awesome, awesome thing. And uh, it's a way to help the show too. A portion of the proceeds goes to the program. That's part of, that's basically the deal. So, you know, you say, well, you go and you buy it, you make your life better, and you also, you know, help your boy. And so it's a really, really cool way to multiple, multiple birds with one stone. We'll be back here in about 90 seconds. Don't go anywhere. It is the Wednesday, July 20th edition of Paleocrat Diaries. Can a personal planner really make you a saint? Not by itself, but in our day and age of addictive apps and glowing screens, we're bombarded by constant distraction, and our quest for sainthood often takes a backseat. The Saint Maker is the first high performance planner for the spiritual life made by faithful Catholics for faithful Catholics. It's a work of genius, really, fusing the wisdom of the saints with the science of personal productivity. It's rigorous, but sainthood is tough, and most of us need help organizing our time, our work, our leisure, and our devotion, because that can help you become a saint. The Saint Maker is elegant, fits in your purse or briefcase, and is a perfect companion for your missal, Bible, or rosary. Published four times per year, each season includes daily planning pages, feast days, and devotions for both forms of the liturgical calendar, goal-setting pages, confession journals, and more. It's why the Saint Maker is used by hardworking Catholics like CEO of Sock Religious Scott Williams, best-selling author Sam Guzman, YouTubers like Amber Schneider, a Catholic wife Dina Barca and Brian Holdsworth, and priests like Father Corey Stitcha. Try the Saint Maker out, and if you decide that it's not for you, you can send it back for a full refund within 90 days. So go right now. Find your life plan at thesaintmaker.com. Quantities are limited, though. So head on over to thesaintmaker.com to order yours and to start your Saint Maker journey today. You got to do it right now. Saintmaker.com slash paleocrat diaries. Oh, boy. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, here we go. All right, that is the sound. That is the sound of excellence. It's the sound of the Paleocrat Diaries alert system. And I hope right now that you are racing to go grab whatever instrument you possibly can. And I would include within that, it's a wide spectrum. It's a wide spectrum. It can be all the way, of course, we include the didgeridoo. We include the harpsichord. We include the drums. We include ukuleles and even guitars, it's true. <laughs> guitars and drums, xylophones, even that really long horn thing that they use in the Ricola commercials at the top of the mountain. And they're like, whoop, whoop. and obviously the shofar. Anything in the world that you have at your disposal to let people know that we are about to enter the octagon of human history. And why? Because we're going to talk about apologetics and we're going to be deep and dive into the mind. We're going to deep dive into the recesses of the mind to find out how in the blazes is it possible that we are deceiving, in fact, ourselves. What's going on with that? What's going on with that? And so resolve right now as you are drinking through that straw, straight to the dome, past the blood-brain barrier. Watch this. Mm. 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 <laughs> Do you see the energy level go up right now? <laughs> by like 5,000? If you didn't, you can see the energy level go up by our telegram. You can go check that out. Super awesome link in description below. And the most powerful energy, right, that we get in like, I don't know, a while, was the fact that Trent Horn, in fact, said your boy's name. Well, close enough. He did the at Paleocrat on Twitter. <laughs> I emailed him, by the way. I hope I hear back, Trent. I do. I hope I hear back. I think that would be, I think it'd be fantastic. And I think that there's some good ideas in that. But I'm not looking to be out there doing that sensationalist, controversialist, super fancy footwork, getting my black belt junk. <laughs> no way. Especially the side 10 Bruggen Kate. <laughs> what are you thinking? Come on, man. Come on. You, you know there's better people than that anyway. 
You know it for a fact. I'll give it up to Dyer, though. I'll give it up to Dyer, and you do, too. You got to give it up to Dyer. I think you did pretty good. For all things considered, for being, you know, into Eastern Orthodoxy and not being a Catholic, I think there were certain things that, that were quite excellent, in fact. I think it'd be a fantastic discussion, but I think it'd be one that'd be done much better than in, you know, uh, Bloodsport Thunderdome. <laughs> Uh, that means you're taking it serious, by the way. That means you're taking it seriously. All right, yeah. And and look, you know, I I for people who don't know, they're like, oh, this guy's talking smack. <laughs> if you don't think there's a little bit eatsers, little bit eatsers of, oh, I'd love to see what it would look like if we had Cy Ten and Jay Dyer and Jeremiah in the same cage kind of thing. Come on, come on. First time, first time. <sighs> it's okay. I can't complain. I can't complain, can I? The fact is, is he's at a place. I think Haley put it the best. We've known for a while that you've been watching. <laughs> We've known it for a while. It's totally true. I don't blame you either. It's an entertaining show. Although I've heard that my cadence can be disorienting. <laughs> I've heard that. I've heard that. Let's see here. I, by the way, I changed it. I, I saw in the chat somebody said, why don't you do that teal one? Yeah. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to drop that bugger down. Look at this. There we go. Okay. So as, as I said, so look, I think it looks better. I had to take off the tie, though. Not going to lie. I had to take off the tie. So, all right. No further ado. Let's pop up this thing real quick. How long have I been on? 15 minutes. I'm good. We're fine. All righty. I want to give a big shout out. It's a community program. Some people, are, some people get razzed. You know, they're like, they're like, I don't understand. Why does this guy talk for like 15 minutes about just random junk? And I'm like, because you get an hour of free content, this is all for free, by the way. If you would like more, it's, I'll, I'll give you a hint. You can just basically skip ahead like 20 minutes every time. And you're going you're gonna to be in there. But the first 20 minutes, introductions, having fun, talking. I used to do a bunch of stuff with like, you know, satire and goofy, goofy stories and stuff like that. Before I would talk for a couple hours. In fact, it was a three-hour, five-day-week program. And that was about politics, religion, and culture. All that stuff you can find in the full catalog in the description here below. And it's all on this channel, in fact. So if you're not subscribed to this channel yet, I strongly implore you to do so. All right, Phil Gonzalez. Dude, you're the first one there, buddy. Wait, well, hold on, were you? We gotta do live chat. Yeah, you're still the first. Oh, no, no, is that true? Are you? Yeah, you're still the first one. <laughs> Dan said, dang it, Phil, you beat me. It's true, it's true, Dan, he did beat you. You really let me down today. Uh, but you put those frogs up there. <laughs> I appreciate the frogs, man. I appreciate the frogs. Um, let's see here. You got, oh yeah, a bunch of, bunch of awesome wolf emojis. Very proud, very grateful for all of you. Definitely 100 bazillion percent. All right. Everyone just thinking now to rock the chart number one, hit rules much. Uh, yeah, we got to do it, man. We got to do it. We got we to rock it out. We got to get up there big time. You know what I mean? And it's one of those things where, look, I'm doing my bestest. I'm doing my bestest. And and I would say that, you know, given it my berry vest, <laughs> I think I I think I've done okay. For one year, it'll be one year tomorrow. And by the way, speaking of tomorrow, tomorrow is my wife's birthday. Uh she turns a solid 25. <laughs> she turns 25. And it's yeah, she looks she looks absolutely stunning. She's a, she's grown more beautiful with time. And I anticipate being goo-goo gaga all over my wife when she's like 90. It's going to happen. She's going to look, people are still going to be carding her. <laughs> she'll be 90 years old. And they're like, ma'am, uh, I need to see your ID for the daiquiri. <laughs> yeah, for the daiquiri. Let's see. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, thanks for calling out Jeremiah and making him have a show tonight. Uh, you know, I got to give it up. That's actually a little bit, a little bit part of that. And yes. Dan P., I am, in fact, drinking the Kool-Aid once again. Mm. Wesley said he brought his juice box. Very, very, very glad to hear that. Uh, it's good to see you, by the way, Wesley. It's good to see you, buddy. Uh, John says, it's weird going around the different channels and seeing a lot of the same people in the chats. Um, it's it's kind of like the Grateful Dead a little bit, but except that, unlike the Grateful Dead, I don't suck. <laughs> <laughs> I said that because Phil's got, Phil right now is like, what? <laughs> How dare you? How dare you talk about the Grateful Dead? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Come on, man. I guess I could have said fish, you know, or Def Leppard. <laughs> People are going to be like, this guy was wrong with him. It's true. And so, yeah, it's, it's all sorts of messed up. 
But uh, okay, so we're we're going down. I'm just I'm just going up here. Yeah, Wesley says Trent's shaking his boots in your opinion. Look, he's doing a little trolling. Yeah, enslaved by truth. I agree too. But you know, look, man, it's a tit for tat, isn't it? Isn't it a little eatsers? Like he's kind of just reacting to the fact that I've kind of been doing that to him. I admitted that I came out with a gusto. It wasn't until the last show that I kind of said, "All right, look, I genuinely I think I got his attention," and now. I'm hoping that he will recognize, you know, the, the the power, the force. You can diminish it all you want. You can diminish it all you want. And you can try to lump it in with other things. But he knows, he knows that's garbage anyway. I mean, he does. Deep down inside, he's too smart. The guy's a super smart guy. So he knows that it's poo-poo trash to be talking that way. <laughs> he knows it is, especially when I've made it abundantly clear. Number one, I did an entire long video. I actually used his tweet about being, you know, a kung fu fighter, trying to get a black belt in junk in debate. And I was, t- I talked about that. I said, look, you know, yeah, that's just not me. I don't really care if people, you know, about is my fancy footwork mega awesome. You'll know if the fancy footwork's awesome based on the arguments that I actually deliver. It doesn't have to be in real time. There's nothing that says, you know, like, what is it? Spartacus 413 that says, you know, unless thou doest a live debate in the Thunderdome, you'll never get your black belt in debate. (laughs) There's nothing like that. That's totally phony baloney sauce. And it is a little bit looking in the mirror a little. You know, I get it. I mean, but that's normally why you have judges and you do it with a debate group and stuff like that. Not on like mass media, unless it's like popularity and stuff. So I don't know. That's just me though. That's just me. And so I hope, you know, I, I hope it works out. As I said, I wrote him an email I laid out what I thought, like, number one, that my purpose is really an in-house debate over a long overdue debate regarding methodology. I think there's a really triumphalistic view in his kind of apologetic that that really does kind of LARP a lot, you know, (laughs) it's kind of LARPy. And it, it basically is saying that it's been that way for just a long, 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 long time. There's numerous different views. In fact, the 20th century and the 21st century were booming with different views. And so it, read, read the book, uh, History of, of Apologetics, Cardinal Avery Dulles. Let's read it, you know. And Phil Gonzalez, yes, I know. The Grateful Dead made you Catholic. I know. That's why I was joking. <laughs> that's why I was having fun with you, man. That's why I was having fun. You know, but, you know, the thing is, I think when people treat it that way, that their method is the only one that can possibly be used and it's good forever and it never needs to change and it's always just the same, blah, blah, blah. I think that's super dupe fake. Super dupe fake. And so I just, I think that it would be, it's long overdue. I also said that, you know, I don't have a ton of respect for Cy 10 Bruggengate, to be quite frank. I mean, I don't know many people, honestly, who do at all. Even in the presuppositional community, is he, is he popular still? Is that, is that true? Is that like one of those things? And uh, regarding Jay Dyer, I've said it a billion times that, look, I have mad respect for that guy's intelligence. There are certain things. Look, I wish he wasn't so Thunderdome, but I get it. I wish he wasn't so blood sport, but that's the way it is. And people can't complain too much because they'll go to YouTube to complain about it. It's a product of it. It's a product of the medium. I've said that for years. And so I'm not, look, you know, but you can say something critical and at the same time recognize uh, an individual's uh, otherwise genius brain and say there are some points that are quite excellent, in fact. Some of them that force us maybe back into the world of stuff talked about by Dr. Jared Goff, talked about by Bonaventure, talked about by Eastern Fathers, talked about they come up in discussions on Trinitarian ontology or come up in discussions uh, ecumenical dialogue that takes place at the highest levels of the church between the East and the West. I think some of that's really important. And so I think there's a, I think there's a really good thing. I think there's a really good thing about that. You know, that we can recognize the value of someone else's apologetic method. Especially if, if I mean, I don't know how somebody can go back and watch that debate and not recognize there's a couple times where J. Dyer really did put him on the spot. And he was, and you could tell I talked about it at length. I talked about it. And I predict, I knew, <laughs> I even knew he'd have to pull it back. So, look, the, the last point, last thing before moving on, is I said, look, um, I think there's other methods. I think there are other methods about this 
where you would be able to do it without the, uh, you know, uh, happy dancing feet, the MC Hammer shoes. They, remember that cartoon Hammer Time? You know, where people want, want to be those shoes. They aspire to be the dancing shoes and stuff. And so they want to know how good and agile they are in the moment and all that. It's really, that is about them. It's not about your argument. And it really is about you. And it makes sense if you're like, you know, accustomed to these rapid fire sorts of things. If that's the way you roll and that's what you've committed yourself to, it makes sense. It does. You know, but it's not scrimmaging, right? It's not sparring in the in the in the pure sense of the term. You're like, well, I'm just sparring in front of, you know, thousands of people at a time. That sort of a thing. You don't express it in the beginning. This is just a sparring match. That's really all it is. It doesn't say anything about, you know, the martial art I'm using itself. I think that's a bummer. So I think there's other ways of doing it that are slower and would avoid, in fact, something that I know deep down inside, I know Trent Horn knows that this is no good, right? At the beginning of the debate with Dyer, Dyer threw out a whole bunch of citations, just rapid fire, blam, 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 blam. I don't think those were any of those documents or any of those quotes that he's referring to were in any kind of, you know, notes and stuff or citations with the links in the description. Maybe I'm wrong. But in the moment, throwing out a whole bunch of those things right at the beginning in the opening statement, right? Just saying, well, that's what this person, this person, this person, this person, this person. And you're just dropping names like, you know, super hot, dropping it like it's hot. That there's no way for the viewer to know. It sounds really compelling. It's in the, in the best that you can do in that moment, if you, especially if you don't know what those particular citations are, is to say, well, um, I don't know what those citations are. That's actually the most humble and honest thing. Or you could simply maneuver without saying that, and you could maneuver for your advantage, admitting that really there's a lot on the line right now, right? Catholicism's on the line with your performance and whether or not you can respond to somebody in real time that threw out a whole bunch of authorities right in your face. And say, yeah, well, you can bring up all those authorities, people, and you can just, however you want to spin it, you can do that. But even the mere fact that you're in that position and the people watching are in the position of hearing this and thinking, man, that sounds mega dope. That's a lot of really big names in a row. It's garbage. It's trash. And so if the real test of that would be, well, are you going to share those sources? That way people and the specific citations, specific like in MLA format, what are you going to do? And that way people can go and verify it, in fact, for themselves. Yeah. I, I'm being told that I'm ignoring my wife. Oh, Ad Haley is a mod. <laughs> okay. How, do I, how am I going to do this? Let me see. Where, where's Haley? Where is she in here? Is she even in? Oh, yeah, there she is. There she is. Okay. Okay. How am I going to do this? Wink. Add moderator. And there you go. Look at that. I took care of you, girl. All right. We got to go. We got to keep ro- keep rocking. It's not going to be super long. I don't want to be on here forever. I really just wanted to just let everybody know that I hadn't died. <laughs> People are like, oh, dude, paleocrat, where is this guy? Where is this guy? And it's like, well, you know, I've been kind of busy. You know, not, not only kind of busy, the truth is, man, I, this past weekend, it was on Sunday, it was the, the anniversary of my daughter's death, six year anniversary of my daughter, Samantha's death of brain cancer, age 12 years old, first born, my mini me, right? Sammy Maya. And it was a rough day. And it's actually been kind of rough dealing with certain junk when you, when you get bigger, and you're, you know, expanding, the empire's expanding, and you're moving onward and upward, you're going to hit crazy bumps in the road, in, including things that you would in, in a million years would have never imagined. You would have never imagined. In fact, you maybe would never have imagined the people who would turn out to turn on you. Kind of a weird deal. But you got to keep rocking it out, don't you? So, okay, last episode, we are talking about the... Um, the self-evident existence of God and how it's indubitable. The knowledge of God, you cannot, nobody on the planet, right, is able to to avoid it. No time, no place, no thing, no nothing. And they, they can't avoid it if they wish to clearly be thinking. But what does that mean if they wish, right, to be thinking clearly, to be thinking rightly? What does that even mean if they wish that? Why would you wish otherwise? Well, it comes down to issues about self-deception. And when we talk about self-deception... 
That brings up, you know, allusions to uh, Romans 1 about how people exchange the truth for a lie that they suppressed, that they pushed down, exchanged that very thing that would have given them life. And instead, when suppressing the truth in exchange for a lie, they decided to not give the creator thanks. They decided to not give the creator praise and instead to worship the works of their hands. It's kind of like when people worship an idol. There's an obvious sense of self-deception. The Bible alludes to this constantly. Why? Because they made it with their hands. <laughs> they made that with their hands. It did not make them. Oh no, this is God, dude. <laughs> this idol is totally the Lord. You're like, no, it's not. Believe it or not. Believe it or not, that is definitely not God. You made it with your hands, weirdo. Yeah. How is it possibly God? It says, but if they are sincere, talking about Colin Causey, but if they are sincere and rational, how can atheists be morally culpable for their unbelief? The answer, quote, by their wickedness, suppress the truth. It's according to scripture. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. So it's plain to them. He has shown it to them. They suppress the truth. Why? Wickedness. Wickedness. St. Paul does not present atheism as a predominantly intellectual problem, which of course seems to reinforce the idea that atheists can indeed be rational. That's something a lot of times people want to think, oh no, they can't be rational. Oh, sure they can. But they're gonna, they're, there's going to be something about it that says it gets to a certain place where it may drive to a certain conclusion and they just simply can't do it. And instead, they end up, they end up falling face first right, into a field of folly. That's what they do. Or they'll say, oh, yeah, 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 uh, no, I don't, I don't believe in God. I, I don't really have a universal standard, objective in any way for, like, morals and stuff. And maybe there's really not morals or anything good or evil. But the truth is, I think what that is, what you're saying over there, is wicked bad evil. Totally evil. You're like, you know how stupid that sounds. Or the idea that you cannot know anything. You know how stupid that sounds. The idea... You can't know absolute truth. You know how stupid that sounds. It sounds really dumb. And yet, and pressed on it, it's not even hard. It's not even hard to, to demonstrate you know, through just a reductio ad absurdum to, to demonstrate to them, as I did in my, my freshman year of college, my freshman year, right? So I'm at school. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. I'm sitting there in school. We're talking, it's a self and community class and somebody brings up this idea and they're like, well, the truth is, you know, uh, there may not be any, uh, you know, truth. It's possible that we really don't know anything actually. And my teacher at the time was like, oh, it's so powerful. Oh yeah. I mean, it's like, you know, you can imagine like a lot of weed smoking before class. <laughs> Just, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and they're like Nag Champa, you know. They're smothering patchouli all over their bodies so they don't smell like weed. <laughs> Even the teacher is. And you're like, oh, she's high. How do you know? She smells like patchouli and nag champa. And I like patchouli and nag champa, by the way. My wife can attest to it. I'm throwing everybody under the bus. <laughs> truth is, I'm picking like two of my favorite. But the truth is, they're, they're smothering it on, right? They're sitting there smoking some weed. They're listening to the Moody Blues. And they're like, oh, yeah, man. Like, it's possible that maybe we don't really know anything at all. Have you thought about that? It's like, oh, dang, yeah, you're like, so true. So true. There's no such thing as absolute truth. <laughs> Absolutely. So I brought up the idea. I said, look, you know, what are we doing here then? Is there actually going to be a right or wrong question at all <laughs> with this? And, I, and they're still like, what do you mean? As if that was a magical, mystical insight I had. And I, I pointed out the window. We had like two trees out there. That's it. Just two. And I said, how many trees are outside? Um, outside the window, in the frame. Ah, oh, Mel, you know, there's two of them. I don't know about that. What if I put 10? And then my answer was 10. You never know. You never know. How dare you say you do know? How dare you? You're going to sound like a real goon. And if that's the way it goes, I'm wasting my money in this class. By the sound of it, I was already tiptoeing that line. I was already tiptoeing it. It's a little bit whack. But they can at least be rational. Once you, once you start demonstrating this, they can get upset all they want, but they know, oh, they know. 
Rather, he presents it as a moral problem. Catechism of the Catholic Church similarly presents atheism as a moral problem. Quote, since it rejects or denies the existence of God, atheism is a sin against the virtue of religion. It's CCC 2125. But if atheists are suppressing the truth, doesn't this make them liars, contrary to the claim that there are sincere atheists? In a word, no. And this is because of the possibility of self-deception. And self-deception can happen subconsciously. Consider experienced past trauma. People deceive themselves in, by, in some cases, subconsciously, suppressing certain truths. For instance, the mother of a convicted serial killer might be so traumatized by the truth that her beloved son is, in fact, a cold-hearted killer that she lives in denial, unable to accept the truth. How many times do we talk this way? And I'll, you know, some kid is a real scumbag. <laughs> you're like, oh, no, not that one. The kid that everybody, you know, you know, the best thing you can say is bless their heart, you know, and they think that's really good. But you're like, it's actually kind of a saying, you know, there's a meaning. <laughs> and but you don't want to tell them that. You don't want to tell them, little Jimmy, you know, I say that, you know, little Rupert or something. And uh, you're like, <laughs> you, you end up saying like, this kid's doing real bad. And you've seen him around town. And he's always doing naughty stuff all the time. But then he finally gets busted. And you're in a room and you're hearing the mom talk. And she's like, oh, no. Oh, no. He definitely didn't do it. Not my sweet boy. My boy would never behave that way. No way in the world. <laughs> and everybody's looking at her like, oh, no. They're like, oh, Sister Susie, um... I hate to inform you, your son is a scumbag. <laughs> your son's a bad kid. We've all seen, he's delightful, bless his heart. But we, we all know, how dare you? How dare you say that about him? We all know it. Maybe you're that way sometimes. I know I've been that way sometimes. Even thinking about my own little kids. My own little ones. It's true. I go even a little further with this, right? Anything that is... Traumatic. Sometimes it's, you know, trauma that really gets to people this way. And, and, and they lie to themselves in self-deception in numerous ways, either by adding to what the actual issue is or taking it away and suppressing it. There's different directions that self-deception here could go. And even, even in it adding to it, rather than trying to shove it down, adding to it and adding explanations and all this around it, that in and of itself, by the weight of it alone, is pushing down the truth. And it's exchanging it for a web of lies. And one of the things that I think is terribly traumatic is the realization that we have when it hits us for the first time that we're mortal. That we are going to die. That we've sinned. That we've done something wrong. And that by ourselves, we simply cannot wash the stain away. Traumatic. We have to know deep inside there's consequences. We know there's something deep inside, something crying out for justice that said it's bad enough that good people have to suffer and bad people get away. But the idea that that's something that just they die and it's another day for all of us here, that idea, we recoil at the thought. We recoil. And so by and large, people, they have to they, they, they tell themselves they have to convince themselves. No, it's not true. No, it's not true. That's not that's not really happening. I'm not crying out for that. I'm okay with it, or I'm not, but it's okay. It isn't necessarily lying. But, like the mother, she is clearly caught in a case of self-deception. A similar thing possibly is going on with respect to the atheist. However, rather than trauma darkening the mind to the truth, as in the case of the mother, whose son is a convicted serial killer, in the case of atheists, it is sin that darkens the mind to the truth that God exists. And I would say sometimes sin is the reaction. I, I would not, I'm not against what he's saying. I would add to it and say, well, for me, it's an, it's an both and. You know, that most of the time that trauma is going to end up creating structures that try to make sense of the world in any other way humanly possible. Any other way humanly possible in order to get the stains off 
without having to recognize the God that made us and his power, his attributes, his divinity. And why? Because he made us. He made us. Because that means we're creatures. And that means we're not God. That means that we aren't perfect. We make mistakes. And that we ultimately need redemption. We ultimately need redemption. We need salvation. We need penance. We need absolution. We don't make it up ourselves. At this point, it might be objected that if an atheist mind is darkened to the point of no longer being able to recognize the truth that God exists, then it seems that he cannot therefore be culpable for his unbelief. The, cru- the crucial disanalogy in this case, however, is that the mother is not responsible for the trauma that caused her self-deception, whereas the atheist is responsible for the sin that caused his self-deception. If this present state of self-deception was itself caused by past sins that he was culpable for, then that he is in a state of self-deception to begin with is in fact due to what? Culpable sin. He would be guilty. He would be guilty. So if it's because of his sin, it's because he's done wicked bad junk, well, guess what? He's, he's at fault for that. Again, it goes back to what I'm saying about, maybe I jumped ahead, that saying that it depends on how you react to certain things. Is it because of the, what you did? You can blame other factors, but how did we get to that point? Was it something, in fact, that you are responsible for? And since unbelief is the result of being in a state of self-deception, the atheist bears at least some culpability for his unbelief. St. Thomas Aquinas, in his commentary on Romans, compares the atheist predicament to being drunk. This, to me, is the genius, in fact, of the genius of Colin Causey. It's true. It's the genius of Colin Causey. And why? Because he found this. This is good. But someone might believe that they would be excluded from the sin of ungodliness on account of ignorance, as the apostle says of himself in 1 Timothy 1.13, quote, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. First, therefore, he shows that they are without excuse. Talking about Romans 1. Secondly, he states their sin there in verse 23, at, uh, and they changed the glory in regard to the first, it should, be noted, it should be noted that ignorance excuses him from guilt when it proceeds and causes guilt in such a way that the ignorance itself is not the result of guilt. For example, when a person, after exercising due caution, thinks he is striking a foe when he's really striking his father. But if the ignorance is caused by guilt, it cannot excuse one from a fault. It cannot excuse someone from a fault that follows. Thus, if a person commits murder because he's drunk, he's not excused from the guilt because he sinned by intoxicating himself. Indeed, according to the philosopher, he deserves a double penalty. Yeah. And so, if you if you find yourself because of your sin and you chose to do this, if that is the case and you chose to do it, then guess what? That ignorance, you are ultimately going to be responsible for that ignorance because that's going to be, as we said before, when talking about uh, Father Lassance and his imagery he uses when he describes um, our understanding of God and the way we see God in the world as through a telescope that's all smudged up and gross and nasty. I like somebody taking like Vaseline and rubbing it all over the other side of a telescope and then putting a whole bunch of flour and like, you know, putting some sardines or something all over it. You know what I mean? (laughs) Chicken feathers. Rubbing a little bit of dog (laughs) poo-poo. That's what it's going to look like. The more sins you do, the more sins you do, the worse it's going to get and you will eventually get to the poop. You will get to the grossness and it's going to be mega whack. It's not going to be any good. It's going to be difficult to see. And you're going to be able to, at that point even, to convince yourself, and that's a dangerous place, to convince yourself that you, in fact, are ignorant. And because you are ignorant of that, it leads you to the idea that you are completely honest, that you're completely upright. And in a weird, wacky way, there is a 
kind of part of you that is, but Not really. (laughs) Like, on the one hand, yeah, sure, you don't know. Why? Because, I don't know, you did a whole bunch of crazy sins. It's like somebody doing a crazy, a whole bunch of drugs and going off the deep end, losing his mind, and someone says, yeah, he's totally innocent for these thoughts. In a way, yes, but he's the one who drove himself to get to the place. Yeah, in the comments, the chicken gizzards. And chicken gizzards all over Dude, don't 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 bust on chicken gizzards. I I busted on sardines. I like sardines though. So I, we we, take, we need to take both of those out of the equation. <laughs> we need to we need to put something in there that's bad, dude. Like that turkey tail. I can't stand that. Can't stand turkey tail, dude. I can't stand uh what would it be sea urchin. That's offensive, dude. <laughs> sea urchin, uncooked sea urchin at a sushi place. <clears throat> it's bad. So yeah, it's like rubbing sea urchin. Give me those gizzards, now. <laughs> Give me the gizzards, right? Give me that lingua. Give me the brain. Give me all of it, dude. I, I, the, you know, I'll eat almost any kind of organ meat. It's delicious. Thus, according to St. Thomas, even when someone who is drunk might not fully consent to the evils that he does while he's drunk, nevertheless, he consented to getting drunk in the first place. So he's still culpable for what he does while drinking. St. Thomas presents a more nuanced view on this issue in the Summa. Quote, Two things are to be observed in drunkenness, as stated above in answer one. Namely, the resulting defect and the preceding act. If, however, the preceding act was sinful, the person is not altogether excused from the subsequent sin, because the latter, the subsequent sin, is rendered voluntary through the voluntariness of the preceding act, i.e. sin. Inasmuch as it was through doing something unlawful that he fell into the subsequent sin. Nevertheless, the resulting sin is diminished, even as the character of voluntariness is diminished. And so you'd have have a situation where, yes, just like I said, your culpability is lowered. So it's like, well, I mean, you're kind of innocent, <laughs> all right, oblivious, ignorant. But the truth is, no, not really. No, it's not a, uh, if I do a bunch of sin, look, guys, I figured out the way to do it. I figured out how to get around this whole, this whole crazy thing. All of God's shenanigans. The way that we do it, commit ridiculous amounts of sins. And if you commit ridiculous amounts of sins, then it's going to like make you suppress the truth for a lie. And then your culpability is lower. <laughs> you know what kind of drug mentality that is? I'm serious, man. That's like, that's like somebody, again, that's like, again, we're back in class. Dude, that was like mega dog. Yeah. Yeah, dude, that's like devil grade weed. That's like straight out of purgatory. No, worse than that. Straight out of hell. Now, along the same lines, an atheist unbelief may be involuntary due to the atheist having a spiritually darkened mind. And this fact could reduce the atheist's culpability for his unbelief. As the Catechism of the Catholic Church says, quote, the, the imputability of atheism can be significantly diminished in virtue of the intentions and the circumstances, CCC 2125. However, the atheist cannot be excused altogether since having a spiritually darkened mind is itself caused by voluntary and sinful acts. Why? Because God is not a jerk. God's not a jerk. That's the consequence of you removing yourself from the light, casting tons of shade on the Lord. And in that regard, darker and darker and darker goes the mind. And because darker and darker and darker goes the mind, because of your sin, you have culpability even if it's diminished it's never altogether again Romans 1 so they are without excuse for although they knew God they did not honor him as God or give him thanks but they became futile in their thinking and their senseless minds were darkened 
And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a base mind and to improper conduct. That's Romans 1, 20 through 21, as well as verse 28. This suffices to answer the objection. The value of apologetics with respect to atheists is that it can help to knock down the intellectual barriers that are preventing the atheist from accepting the existence of God and consenting to the promptings of his grace. By the way, those barriers, largely the result, whether initially or actively in the meantime, of his own self-deception. It's like a, a weird relationship that it has. Those, those things of, of deception on the outside gain strength because of the darkness, because of the things that you have done, in fact, to yourself that you have allowed yourself to do, whether in response to something, including especially things that are truly heinous, or your response to things that weren't truly heinous. You, in fact, were just being truly heinous. Even if an atheist is in some sort of state of self-deception, it does not follow that he cannot nevertheless be reasoned out of that self-deception. It'd be interesting. I'm not entirely sure. I don't know if I would want to use phrase it that way. Reasoned out of it. Right? That it's just purely reason. Because we're talking spiritual stuff here. We're not, we're not just talking. We're talking the dark, a, a spiritual kind of darkness. A wicked kind of thing that's going on. Things that are the product of sin in our lives. And in that regard, in that regard, um, I don't want to say that it's like, well, we can just reason out of it. I'd like to think that it is, that there's also, of course, the dynamic of the need for faith, in fact. And that this is a gracious thing. Not just simply a natural reason thing. And I don't know if that's exactly how you'd phrase it, Maybe it's a point of clarity. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. So I don't want to put it into his mouth. I just want to make clear for myself, just in case that is, if if that's the reading that you do when you read the essay, that I would just, I, I would want a little bit more clarification on it. So while the existence of God is itself self evident, and this is Colin, in the sense that if we grasp the essence of God, we could see that he must exist, it is not self evident to us. And this is because we do not know, at least not naturally and innately, God's existence. This is one of those differences between the more Thomistic Colin and the Bonaventurian Jeremiah. And I won't go into more detail than I did last week. The last episode we did was entirely about that topic. 100%. Okay. about, About the first thing that falls into the mind, right? What is that? Talked a little bit, a little bit about Trinitarian ontology. Uh, talked about Bonaventure, uh, Bonaventure's idea of and, and Saint Augustine on divine illumination. That the very first thing in our mind, in fact, is pure act. So while the and by the way, I've been reading. I just got a, a book by uh, what is it, Rosmini? Yeah, excellent. It's pretty good. I've got. I'm going through Jared Goff's book, Doctor Goff. Going through his book, uh, Caritas and Primo. Awesome. Also touches on things like that. So while the existence of God, okay, okay, rather, our natural knowledge of God derives from an intuitive inference from the existence and character of the creation to the existence of the creator in a similar way in which we know that a fire must exist because we see the existence of smoke. I don't know if I would buy that line unless you've seen, unless you've seen fire. Unless you know what fire is. You can't use smoke and go, well, yeah, that's fire. Unless you've seen fire. I don't know. And again, we talked about the ordering of these things. We talked about the source of them. Right? We talked about what is it that we know? What is it that we see? To what extent? Is it an inference? Is it implicit? Definitely not explicit. We're not seeing the beatific vision. (laughs) Okay? Not doing that. So while we do have a kind of innate sense of God, it's vague and confused. I agree with that. 
due to, we might add, in order to extend an olive branch to our reformed brethren, the noetic effects of sin. Again, true. In fact, I it's interesting to hear some of the things. I, I, I don't know, to be honest, I've never read a ton of like Platinga. Like I, I've never done that. Or like reformed epistemology, like that that movement of, of people. Um, but the idea, when I was reading through some of the quotes in this article, I thought, you know, that's actually a lot like, we have, we have uh, saints of the church, including Bonaventure, who would say things like that. Kind of an interesting thing. Even John Calvin, I, I thought, it's kind of a weird thing, you know, when you see, when you see some, some, let's say a Protestant is talking about the Trinity, we can see in that language, we can see that there might be things in that that are very orthodox and true. And then they go off in some crazy direction with something we go, oh, yeah, that's bad. <laughs> so we, we can say, we can give credit where it's due and recognize the deficiencies that their system produces. And I think the same thing is true of reformed epistemology. I think it's an interesting, an interesting thing. From the from at least from the quotes that I read. You tell me. Okay. But the noetic effects of sin, the idea, sin on the mind. What is it doing to you? Smudging up, right? Of the telescope. Smudging that bugger up. Through philosophical analysis and natural theology, and also by supernatural revelation, we can come to have a much more precise and complete knowledge of God's existence and his nature. So I agree with that. I think that, that anywhere that revelation is taking place, which I would include, by the way, I would include the, the knowledge that our soul has, in fact, of God, the knowledge that the soul has of itself. I would say that there are ways, just like Augustine said, just like Anselm, just like Bonaventure, that there are ways that we can do that because why? We, in fact, are part of nature. We are created. We are all part of the created order. Thus, the existence of God, he doesn't, uh, uh, Colin does not believe that it is as self-evident in the same way that the principle of non-contradiction is. I would say, as with Bonaventure, that the indubitability of God's existence, the self-evident nature of God's existence is a greater kind of self-evidence than any other created truth. Any other one. That there's no, there's no other truth quite like it. Yeah, some people, however, like Thomas Nagel, atheist, he's an uh, atheist philosopher, right? Or philosopher like Thomas Nagel, admit that they have a bias against belief in God. I want atheism to be true. That's what he said. I want atheism to be true and made uneasy and, and I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't want, that I don't believe in God and naturally hope that I'm right in my belief. It's that I hope there's no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. What a tragic case, by the way. You know, what is that? That's, that's like beyond heartbreaking. He's like, you know, he hopes that there's no God. He doesn't want that. He says, I lack the census uh, uh, divinitatis that enables, indeed compels so many people to see in the world the expression of divine purpose as naturally as they see in a smiling face the expression of human feeling. That's from Mind and Cosmos. Why the materialist neo-Darwinian conception of nature is almost certainly false. It's a tale of two Thomases. But given the admission in the first quotation, might it be that Nagel does not lack the senses divinitatis, but is rather suppressing it, perhaps subconsciously, because he does not want there to be a God. Perhaps this desire for there not to be a God has placed him in a kind of spiritually intoxicating state that he needs to be revived from in order for the census divinitatis to function unimpaired. As Tertullian put it, the soul, although it be repressed in the prison of the body, though it be wrapped around depraved customs, though it be weakened by lust and passion, though it be enslaved by false gods, yet 
when it revives as from intoxication or from sleep or from some illness and regains its health, it calls God by that only name which is proper to the true God, great God, good God. That's from his apology. Coming down to the end. In fact, the next episode, which I may do, I, I don't know if I'm going to do it tomorrow. I think I'm going to want to do a stream with my wife on um, the Wolfpack chat, but at night because we want to we want to enjoy our day with her. Okay. In fact, we don't really go out to eat very often. We might we might do something kind of fancy pants. We might do I don't know. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do something. I got to buy her cake. <laughs> we got to buy a nice cake. It's gonna be awesome. If our opponent believes nothing of divine revelation. There's no longer any means of proving the articles of faith by reasoning, but only of answering objections, if he has any, in fact, against the faith. You know, it's one of these things where, where to me, I press it even further because I believe that there's something inside of them that, in fact, is divine. It, look, it's, it's created, but you're like, look, it's, it's, it's a spiritual thing. It's a spiritual thing and they know it intimately. They know it more than anything else. It's, it's where they're there. It's the, the source of so much inside of them. Their identity that continues to go on. That's not simply tethered to the brain, their conscience that you're tapping into that law that's been imprinted upon their heart. Those kinds of things to, to be able to go into that and say, look, it's inside. It is not far from you. And we can prove that. But it doesn't matter about proving it. It's about hearing it. It's about hearing that word of God delivered to them. Not some, you know, weird positivism that's like, oh, if I just give them all the the right answers, they're going to download it. And if they download it, then they're going to do all the right stuff. That's super fake. It's more than that. What the presuppositionalist should want to do is to affirm the unbeliever's belief in rationality. Okay. That's why why we use the transcendental argument, by the way. And the first principles of reason and and not try to castigate them as being hopelessly irrational because they're not. From there, and it's not just, it's not just like a, like a in like an archetypal thing, like we're talking exemplars. In my view, right? We really are in Christ, right? Christ, of Him, by Him, in Him, through Him. Yeah, man. From there, the presuppositionalists can argue that while unbelievers are correct in their beliefs and rationality, right, and those most basic ideas about reason, if in fact they even are about that. Their worldview cannot make sense of these things. They cannot make sense of those beliefs. Consequently, their worldview should in fact be rejected. You would be able to demonstrate there. You would be able to demonstrate why their system caves in on itself. Yeah. All right, we're going to do this real quick. I only went for an hour because I don't want to, I don't want to do the next part. In fact, I kind of already did a little, I kind of already did a little, but I got to go, I got, I got to go through I'll show you what the next part is. Let's see. Who's presuppositionalism? That gets back to the very way that we started the program, talking about the tweet that happened on Trent Horn's Twitter account. And if you would like to see the conversation take place, I'm not talking a rap battle with Trent Horn, much less with Cy 10 Bruggenkate and company. But I'm saying if you, if you believe that this kind of thing is long overdue and needs a genuine conversation about it, one that is planned and thought out, maybe I should be the person to host it, in fact. Maybe Trent, maybe that's not his thing. Maybe Catholic Answers, I don't know, maybe it's kind of more into the world of like, you know, clickbait and stuff. And I hope you know I'm trying to call them out a little bit, but it's true. If, if, it's, if it's more, if it's not about having an honest assessment of, of something that they have talked about, 
repeatedly on the fly drive by stuff. That's what it was what happens. Uh yeah, you can't believe in presuppositionalism. You're like, Bleh. you're like, what's that? And you're like, oh, it's Trent Horn. <laughs> Trent Horn going down the road. Right? Shooting that machine nerf gun at you again. I'm like, oh, what? <laughs> why is he doing that? I'm sitting on the porch having some beer, man. Why don't you come over? I'll give you a cigar. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Why are you shooting those? Why are you shooting those? Shooting them? Why are you shooting those Nerf balls at me? <laughs> why are you doing that? Those weird arrows. What's that all about? With a little suction cup on them. <laughs> it's not phasing me, and it's like, look, it ain't stopping anytime soon. But I think maybe I, I mean, look, I hate to say this. This really is a bummer, because we're going to talk about next episode. We'll talk about wh- who's presuppositionalism. It'll go in mainly to reform stuff because that's really the main camp that talks about it. And so, um, and I've already addressed some some things to do with um, Eastern Orthodoxy. But the idea being that um, if if this conversation warrants the debate that I believe that it warrants, and I'll just dead serious, no joking, right? No more suction cups, no more Nerf balls. If it warrants a discussion, and I believe it does, and an increasing number of people believe that it does, um, that discussion must in fact be better. I believe it should be. Even if I have to do extra work, even if I have to be more patient, and if I have to, to, to go different routes and deal with different people that aren't into the happy feet, that aren't into the kung fu fighting of the, the um, Thunderdome, the blood sport of the Thunderdome, right? The, the flash in a pan apologetic, if, if they are, if, if I need to go to people who are more serious about that, then I will. Because I think it warrants, in fact, I think that the catalog of material that we've put out on this one issue alone, and with the one issue, the books that we've gone through, the way that we've demonstrated it, the sources that we've used, the saints that we've cited, Right? The way that we've looked at the faith, the way that we've talked about different schools of thought philosophically, theologically, the way that we have demonstrated this through reason over and over and over. In fact, confronting particular claims made off the cuff, sometimes though, silly ones even published in high profile magazines. Silly ones, easily swatted away. A lot of those readers will never know. But I have, I have to believe that deep down inside, some of the people in higher positions, some of those people, they do know it. They may not like that their arguments have been exposed. They just need to come up with different ones. It doesn't mean it's over. They can come up with better arguments. But the arguments that they've used thus far, it's trash. It's done. It's not even, it, it doesn't even phase me. So when they say, oh, it's the howler of a circular argument. Boing. Like that's what that is to me. When people say, you can't believe that because the Vatican won. You can't believe that because John Paul II. You can't believe that. Because Thomas Aquinas, you can't believe that, bro. You can't believe that because uh, who are you to say that a nihilist who doesn't believe in truth can't have a worldview where he says stuff is true? (laughs) What's a guy to do? I can't do that forever. Look, at some point you got to go, dude, that's kind of a joke. You can't be quoting people like Van Tell and Bonson. These people are quoting William Lane Craig. <laughs> These people are quoting C.S. Lewis. These people are quoting Montgomery. They're quoting Sproul. They're quoting Gerstner. Pascal. The guy's a Jansenist. A heretic, by the way. And yet, quoting... And yet, 
Why is that? Because when it comes to philosophy in that way, when it comes to reason, what's the matter with that? Even on theology, are you not allowed to recognize something that somebody says that you're in an ecumenical dialogue with, trying to get that brother back, and to recognize something powerful that somebody says? Or is that that weird epistemic thing that says that they can't say anything that's actually true? Isn't there a weird little thing happening there where the presuppositional guy is saying that? (laughs) And the others are going, no, you got to only quote Thomas the Catholics just like we believe. How dare you? (laughs) Hair on fire. I'm too serious for that. I know it sounds weird because I'm joking. I'm having fun. But I'm actually being really serious. I'm too serious for that. This is too big of a deal for that. And just like I told people early on, I didn't make, when I, when I did a novena after I left Holy Faith Media, I did a novena, right? St. Jose Maria Escriva, one of my all-time favorites. I did a novena. I'm at St. Stephen's. And I'm going through trying to think, what am I going to do? What do I need to do? It involved writing, and it involved paleocrat diaries. I made good on one so far, and I'm making good on the other. Even in, even in something different behind the scenes. December 1st, remember, is going to be Timothy Flanders um, uh, publishing, making available the book about my daughter. That's the first thing, okay? And then there'll be another book that'll be coming out, as well as I'm putting together, in the same time, I'm putting together the corpus of the poetry the prose and the speculative fiction that I've written. But when I did this, when I did this novena, right? At the end of that, somebody brought up to me the three things that any business needs to do. It needs to think about three different things. What do you want? And priority, because all of them kind of are together, a little bit inevitable for the most part. You have to almost actively do something to not get a little bit of all of them. But what is the main driving force? Is it money? Is it a name for yourself? Or is it influence? Do you even need to guess which one I picked? Influence. Money, I can't bring that in the grave. I knew that because it was weird enough putting a bald eagle feather inside of my daughter's casket given to her by a tribe because she was a warrior with the name Anungukwe, which means star girl. That was weird. Now, what's she going to do with that thing? It was an honor, but money? <laughs> what am I going to do? <laughs> what am I going to do with that money? Okay. And then on top of that, what about a name? No. That's why I don't care about the fancy footwork necessarily. That's why I don't care about the octagon, the, 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 the thunder dome. I care about the octagon, not the thunder dome. I don't care about the blood sport. I don't care about the fancy feet, the dancing shoes, the black belt sparring nonsense. I don't care about that. Because ultimately, like I've said before, you can end up living an, ama- an amazing life, have tons of people. You're in major magazines. You have mansions, multiple mansions, a private jet. You've got all these books about your life, autobiographies. You've got everything. All this stuff. You're on tons of shows, tons of movies, on the radio. People painted pictures of you. Named things after you. And then you finally croak one day. You breathe your last. <laughs> And you're dead. And the New York Times, New York Times, the Washington Post, the Wall Street Journal, they throw you there into the obituary section. You are honored with this amazing obituary written probably by somebody who's extraordinarily talented himself. Do any of you guys know who died today in any of those? Did you read them? Did you skip over it? Do you even care? What if we went back 10 years? What if we went back 20 years? What if we went back 50 years? Would you even know them? Maybe. I mean, you'd be like, oh, yeah, that guy. I remember that guy. Yeah, he was in a, uh, um, he was like in a movie. (laughs) That's it. But the influence, the influence. 
I think that makes it tough for the people who don't like what we're doing. Because, so what if you try to come at the man? So what if you try to come at somebody and say, I'm going to, I'm going to make it so that you don't make a lot of money. I'm going to come and I'm going to, I'm going to try to deplatform you. Uh, We're resilient. Why? Because the idea we're talking about is the Lord. The new evangelization, the new apologetic. Yeah. We're talking big stuff. The restoration, in fact, the reconciliation of all things in Christ. Everything, including me. I will gladly bow down. I will gladly be placed at his footstool. And I will summon and I will call and I will do everything I can to bring them in, even at the expense of my name, even at the expense of any money, any fame. And that's why we're going to win. Because in the end, it's not us winning. In the end, you know, it's the Lord winning. And he always wins, doesn't he? He always wins. Are you ever afraid that he's going to lose? If you are, that'd be a really ridiculous thing. That would be totally absurd. I strongly advise you. I strongly advise you as Dr. Paleocrat to take two scoops of Paleocrat Diaries every single day (laughs) at the Wolfpack Chat in one scoop. On the other scoop, you've got our YouTube stuff. And another scoop, you've got articles on another scoop. It's all over the place. Take three, take four, take five. Do whatever you got to do because at the end of the day, all we're trying to do is to work it out that you can be a better you, that we can be a better we, in fact, that I can be a better me, and that we can do this together. We're going to do that every single day. We already do over at the Wolf Pack. We already do. It is an awesome thing, by the way. Amazing people. Somebody sent a, a, a friend, Michael, sent a really awesome picture, a drawing of Our Lady and Our Lord, and it's so powerful. And it took me a minute to figure it out because Our Lady looking so beautiful, holding on to the little, the little Christ child in her, in her right hand. And in her left hand, she's presenting him an owl. And that owl is the one right there. My daughter. My daughter. Tomorrow, the 21st, in fact, today is my daughter's funeral as well. It's the, it's the memory of this. Please pray for us. But specifically, most of all, please pray for my wife. I'm not going to cry. <laughs> I love you guys. But pre- seriously, pray for her. And pray for us here at Pillicrat Diaries. Until next time. Never give up. Keep on smiling. And momentum more. I want to make people dream bigger thoughts.